Hello. You're about to watch a presentation made at the Taiwan Trade Show by John Burke, President of Trek. The Bike Portland blog wonders whether Burke is the Al Gore of the bike industry. John Burke also wants to save the planet, and a key way to do that is to get more people on bikes. I want to talk to you today about what I think the biggest uh, opportunity is in the bicycle industry. And most people who are here are involved in the bicycle industry and there are so many things going on in our industry that today is kind of a good time to step back and take a look at the big picture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how our business has grown over the years. So there's two, uh, two major things that have happened in the past 25 years. The first one has been the mountain bike boom, which started in the mid-80s and it lasted through the mid-90s. And that really grew the business. And the second piece that really grew the business is the road bike boom. And when Lance Armstrong won the, his first Tour de France in 1999, that kind of started the road bike boom. And that's really lasted for the last seven years. Many people in here who are part of the bicycle industry have grown their business along with those two events. Now, if you take a look at many people in the industry, they take a look at growing the business for the next 20 years based on two things. Uh, the first one is product. And over the next uh, 20 years, the industry will come up with a lot of great ideas and a lot of great products. And we spent the past two days walking around this show and you see a lot of really cool products. You see a lot of carbon fiber things, you see a lot of new wheel sets, you see a lot of new folding bikes. There's a lot of ideas and consumers love ideas and that's a great way we can grow our business. The only thing is, is it's really not that unique. It's the same thing we've been doing for the last 20 years is we've had a lot of new ideas and a lot of new products. So the other way we grow our business is based on marketing. And if you take a look at the bicycle industry, the bicycle industry is doing better marketing today than we've ever done. And you take a look at people like Giant or Specialized or Trek or Giro, and people are spending a lot of time and effort and money to go out there and market their product. The only thing about marketing is, it's basically the same thing that we've done for the last 20 years. A focus on product and a focus on marketing. And what I uh, believe is that a focus on marketing is good and a focus on product is good, but there's more <laughs> to our business than those two things. So what I want to talk about now is I want to talk about some interesting global trends. Kids between 6 and 11 have grown by 11 pounds. Men over 20 by 24 pounds. And the average woman over the past 42 years has gained 24 pounds. And this is not just happening in the United States. It's happening in Western Europe and it's happening in other places around the world as we have less activity than ever before. If you want to take a look, this is a very interesting uh, map. And this map is from 1985, and it shows the amount of people who are overweight and obese in the United States. Of 1985, that's three years later, 1988, 1990, 1992, 1994, 1996, in 1997 we have our first red states, 1998, 1999, 2000, first yellow state, 2001, 2, 3, 4, that's where you are in 2004. Now the interesting thing about taking a look at those series of maps is there is an obesity epidemic that's happening in the United States and it's happening in other parts of the world. There's a huge government spend in terms of health care. 
to take care of these obese people and it's going to become a bigger burden on the government and the people as time goes on. I spend a number of days a year in Washington DC and some of those days are talking about health. And in the United States there's a couple interesting things and that is, is the people who really know about health in the United States say that this problem cannot be solved by money. There's no money that can do it. Is It's going to become such a burden on the government and the people that the only way that the United States will solve this problem is physical activity. Is it's really preventative health. There's not going to be a drug that can do it. So that's the first global trend if we take a look at it. The second global trend is traffic congestion. All right, and this is the case in Taipei, it's a case in Amsterdam, it's a case in New York, it's a case all around the world is traffic congestion. In 2003, traffic congestion delayed people worldwide for 7 billion hours and wasted 5 billion gallons of fuel. There's something very interesting here, and it's the same as the obesity epidemic and that is, is this problem is getting worse, it's not getting better, and there's really no amount of money that people can spend to solve this problem. The more roads and the more freeways that are added, they can't keep up with congestion. Our third trend is urbanization. And there's a couple statistics here that I think are pretty interesting. And the first is in 1950, the world had two megacities of over 10 million people. Today that number is over 20. In China there are 200 cities alone that are over a million people. The United Nations estimates that 180,000 people a day are moving into the cities today that more people live in cities than live in rural areas. And that trend is continuing. Those are three major trends. What's the fourth major trend is the environment. Three key facts about the environment is emissions from cars far outweighs that from power plants. Vehicles contribute 60 to 70 percent of air pollution. And 60 percent of the pollution created by car emissions happen in the first few minutes of operation. One of my favorite statistics is that 50 percent of car trips are less than two miles. You take a look at all of this pollution being caused by automobiles and 50 kind percent of, of it is less than two miles. To address all these problems. It's an amazing statistic. And I go back to what we're spending all of our time doing and that's developing products and spending money on marketing and yet there's a product you know the best that we can develop to address is, all of these things. The best thing about the product is is that we already have it. It's the bicycle. Let's take a look at how the bicycle can solve problems. Health issues, bicycling, you burn 500 to 700 calories an hour. I'm told that driving a car you can burn 5 to uh, 20 calories. <laughs> Bicycling promotes healthier lifestyle, strengthens family bonds, and provides recreational activities for all sorts of people. A four-mile journey in London is 40 minutes. If you take it by bicycle, it's 22 minutes. And you can put 7 to 12 bicycles in a uh, one parking spot of a car. That's a product that we already have. It's nothing new, it's something that's been around for quite some time. So in my uh, view, the industry's greatest opportunity is to create a bicycle friendly world. And to me the best uh, thing about that is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Take a look at it, a bicycle friendly world already exists in a number of places. It already exists in the Netherlands, it already exists in Boulder, it exists in London, and it exists in Portland, Oregon. All of those communities are very bicycle friendly and they're also spending time and money to make those communities even more friendly. 
but this can be done. Creating a bicycle friendly world is not a pipe dream. So let's take a look at some statistics here. Trips taken by bicycle. In the Netherlands, trips taken by bicycle are 30%. In Denmark, it's 20%. In Germany, it's 14 In Switzerland, it's 10 In Austria, it's 9 In Canada, it's 2 And in the United States, it's less than 1%. I take a look at that, and you take a look at the United States, and you say, well, that's a problem. I take a look at it, and I say, wow, that's an incredible opportunity. If you take a look at the rest of the world, the rest of the world is closer to the United States than it is to the Netherlands. And that's why I believe that as a bicycle industry, there's such an incredible opportunity in making this a bicycle-friendly world. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, it's at 2%. In Washington, D.C., it's at 1%. And again, the average is less than 1%. And I said, what if uh, the world's bike usage was more like it is in the Netherlands or in Boulder? And I found a great quote from the mayor of London here. And for people who have not been to the U.K., the U.K., uh, 10 years ago is not the most bicycle friendly place and even today it's got a long way to go but the issue is is it's moving in this direction and the mayor of London said cycling is the fastest cheapest most healthy and environmental environmentally friendly way to get around London which is why we're investing 20 million pounds this year to improve cycling facilities in the capital the number of cyclists on our road has doubled since 2000. We've already exceeded our cycling targets. And they're looking at tougher targets to encourage more cycling. Now the beauty of this is this is the mayor of London. So here we are as the bicycle industry, and we have the benefit of having politicians who get it, who understand what the bicycle can do, and they're working for us. And these are things that can be done. I took a look at just the U.S. market and I said if bicycle trips in the U.S. grew from one half of one percent to five percent, what would happen to the size of the bicycle industry in the U.S.? And it's really an amazing statistic. Today it's six point two billion dollars. That would grow to thirty one billion dollars. It would multiply at times five. So remember that in Boulder, Colorado, it's already 21%. In Davis, California, it's 25%. And in the whole country of Holland, it's 25%. So this is achievable, and that's what can, can happen. Now, one of the, if you would have asked this question five years ago, and you would have said, where is the last place that you could create a bicycle-friendly community? one of the last places you would have said would be Louisville, Kentucky. And about a week ago, we were at a national bike summit in the United States, and the mayor of Louisville was there. And the mayor of Louisville had been in Colorado three or four years ago. He had seen the bike pass. He would seen people riding on the bike pass. And he said, I'm going to make Louisville a bicycle-friendly city. And so his job is he came back to Louisville he says I want to make that a bicycle friendly city he said I want to get bicycling fully integrated into the transportation network I want to get all these people feeling comfortable and safe about riding their bicycles and he worked with business leaders he worked with bicycle advocates he worked with the community and they've done a few major projects there <coughs> they built a 27 mile bicycle path through the middle of the city and then they took this path and they created this blue path all around Louisville that's a hundred mile path that they're creating around Louisville this is what's been done in three years time and in three years this is one of the statistics that they point out is uh, bicycle annual boardings on buses in 2001, it was 9,000 units, and in 2005, it had grown to 91,000. 
that's an indication of how people are using their bicycles in Louisville. There's a basic, simple premise for the bicycle business, and that is if you build the facilities and if you build trails, people will use them. And I showed you the numbers where bike trips are less than 1%, but the U.S. really got it about 10 years ago when the industry got involved with the government and we said we really want to create a more bicycle-friendly country. And I put out here a key figure and I says, how much money did the industry give for bicycle advocacy? And I figure that before 1995, it was zero. Every once in a while, bicycle advocates would come to the industry and they'd ask for money. They used to come to me and they'd ask for money and I would shoo them away. I'd say, no thank you, I've got other things that I need to worry about. And then I kind of figured it out in 1997 and I said, you know, we're going to support these people. And other people in the industry said, we're going to support advocates. And we're going to use this money to go lobby the government. And we came up with about $2 million. <coughs> That's what we spend on a yearly basis. It's not once a year. It's a yearly basis. And then we started working with the government, because there are people in the government who believe that bicycles were a simple solution. In 1995, the government spent about $20 million a year building bicycle trails. And we thought they could do more, and we went and we told people throughout the government that bicycles are a great thing. Ten years ago, those people thought we were nuts when we went and we talked to them and we told them how great bicycles were. I was there last week and we had a number, whole group of people throughout the industry. I think there was 425 of us. When we went and we talked to the government, we're no longer nuts. People have figured out that the bicycle is a simple solution to complicated problems. Today the government is spending almost $800 million a year on bicycle facilities. That's a major change. If you talk to people who have seen this and you talk to the politicians, they say that if the industry never spent the $2 million, you would never get the $800 million. That people had to go there and spend some time and money to get that done. In the last transportation bill that was passed, the government is spending $100 million a year on safe routes to school. The woman who runs this program, Deb Hubsmith, I saw her last week, and when the transportation bill comes up in five years, her goal is not to get $100 million a year. Her goal is to get $500 million a year. I'm not sure she'll get $500 million a year, but no one ever thought she'd get $100 million a year. It's an amazing program, and there are some amazing things that are being done. And now let's take a look at our product, the bicycle. We got the perfect product at the perfect point in time. What, what should we do with that? And it's my belief that there's a lot that we can do with it. The first one is for the industry to understand that the number one way to grow the bicycle business is to realize that it's by creating a bicycle friendly world. We can spend a lot of time here on 8 speed, 9 speed, 10 speed, working with carbon fiber to get it down to a 14 pound bicycle. We can work on the next folding bike and all those things are great things to do, but what we really need to understand through all the different bicycle companies and people involved in the industry is this fact that the fastest way you can grow this business and the biggest way that we can have an impact on society is to understand that creating a bicycle friendly world is a very good thing. Name any other group that can have an impact on health, <coughs> that can have an impact on congestion, that can have an impact on obesity, and that can have 
an impact on all those different areas and the environment. Darn a lot. We can do that, but you have to go talk to lawmakers. You know, it's like if you want to sell something, you've got to go talk to your customers. If you want to make the bicycle, if you want to have a bicycle friendly community, you have to go talk to government leaders. Government leaders will listen to you. The thing I put down is get involved with advocates. There's a lot of people who put in a lot of hours working to make the bicycle a very uh, popular thing. In the United States, there's a few key things. There's Bikes Belong. There's IMBA, which is the International Mountain Biking Association. If there are no places to ride your mountain bike, I'm not going to sell any mountain bikes. If there are twice as many places to ride your mountain bike, chances are mountain bike business will go up. Now the fourth thing, and I had an opportunity to talk to a bunch of leaders in the industry this morning, is I believe that the industry really needs to redirect resources away from traditional spending to advocacy. For every uh, $100 that a company spends, a company, or for every $100 in sales, a company will spend $3.9 on marketing, a company in the bicycle industry will spend $1.6 on product development, and that same uh, company will spend uh, 10 cents on bicycle advocacy. So I, I take a look at that and I kind of go, I, I don't think that makes sense we keep doing the same thing and that's not always the best thing to do. So I really think as an industry we need to kind of step back and take a look at how we spend money. And so if you take a look at leaders in the bicycle business, including me, why do we spend the amount of money we spend on marketing and the same amount on product and little on advocacy kind of proud at Trek, we kind of do a lot with advocacy and I think we've kind of taken a leadership role there, but then I look at this graph and I go, I, I don't think we're making the right decision here. And so that was a point of conversation this morning and that's something that I'll try and get done over the next, over the next year is to spur that debate within the industry as to where we're spending our money.